All right, we are back, and we are uh, recording this just on the eve of mm. the Oscars. So we are uh, we don't we don't have an opinion yet on who won. <laughs> this is this will be this will be released uh, basically the uh, just we, we're gonna re- release this just before the Oscars. So uh, yeah. You know, we're, well, well, we have done the big, uh, yes, yes, the yes, big everything, show. Everything's been, everything's, yeah, 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 big show. yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, the uh, boy, that, what an Oscar show that was, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although I did, I kind of blew it, didn't I? Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the magic, so, the magic, of the, <laughs> the magic. So, in any case, yeah, we will, uh, we will be, we'll be, we'll be back next week with all of our uh, our Oscar roundup opinions and everything else. Uh, but in the meantime. Uh, there's not really anything else to, to talk about, right? No. What, what are we going to talk about? Hopefully no one has actually been sexually harassed or anything. Yeah. Like, isn't it interesting, though, that that has started to, um, I don't know, subside a bit. I mean, a, a few dangling. Yeah. Uh, there's the, the Los Angeles uh, Police Department is still evaluating whether yeah. or not they're actually going to bring any charges against Harvey. I think New York is doing the same. Thing. Well, and Meryl Streep like and, kicked like kicked him in the teeth for including her in his lawsuit, yeah. uh, whatever it was. Uh, but other yeah. than things that were already underway, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of new. As it was for a while there, when you know, and I, but I suppose that was always doomed to happen. Eventually, everyone would get ratted out. This is all information overload. Our news, our brains, and our news cycle, and our lives can only absorb so much stuff. Yeah, and that's just where we are. So, in any case, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna start off with uh, we had a bunch of great anime, mostly from Funimation, but some cool stuff from other companies as well. And uh, I will start off with something from Kraken releasing, which is. Um, Anime related. Uh, this is this is you know this is certainly Japanese. It has uh, anime roots, but it is not a uh, it is not an anime film per se because it actually has uh, uh, live action in it. But it is uh, Garo, the Dark Knight. I wonder where they got that title. Mm. Uh, Garo is a definitely very creepy uh, anime. Uh, uh, anti-hero, I guess, is maybe the best way to to, to do. There's a whole uh, mythology to to Garo that uh, you know Garo basically looks like uh, an angry reject from the villain uh, pantheon for the Power Rangers. <laughs> they all they're all sort of variations on on samurai aesthetics, right? The yeah. you know the horns and the the armor, and then we just take all that stuff and we just sort of make a monster out of it. Is the idea? Yeah. Which is all that you see on Power Rangers. All of that stuff is, you know, samurai aesthetic. Uh, but anyway, the uh, this is this. If you know the whole Garo mythology, I guess this will be more meaningful. Uh, this, I'm sure, this probably plays better in Japan than it does here. But it's a beautiful Blu-ray to look at. Uh, if nothing else, it is visually very, very impressive, and they've done a wonderful job uh, putting all this on here. But uh, don't expect for it to make much sense unless you are already immersed in the mythology itself. Uh, another Gundam, but this one's really, really great. This is Mobile Suit Gundam Unicorn, the complete collection from Right Stuff. You can find this by going to rightstuffanime.com. That's stuff with one F, mm. rightstuffanime.com. Head on over there for this latest, greatest, uh, pretty awesome Gundam. You know, Gun- the, again, the mythology of Gundam is just massive, and it just encompasses so much. But uh, all you really need to know is that uh, there's a lot of war and the, uh, the 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 suit is really cool. And if you can get to that point, the uh, the animation here is really some of the best that I've seen in the various Gundam incarnations. Uh, this takes place uh, three years after the end of the Second Neo Zeon War. You know, the Second Neo. I thought that first Neo Zeon War was just so bad, <laughs> but the second one really, really took the cake. Uh, anyway, uh, the uh, yeah, the, 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 there there are always these different empires and different groups and different movements, and it it you know you really have to sort of immerse yourself in this to uh, to completely make sense of it. But it's okay. I still love all of the, the the techno stuff, and the animation is just really really first rate. And there are a ton of special features on here, including episode recaps, which you need because they are so incredibly uh, narratively dense. Uh, seven episodes total. And uh, it's a cool set. Mobile Suit Gundam Unicorn, the complete collection. 
And then we got a couple from uh, Sente, uh, which are sort of in the same vein. Sente has releases a lot of this stuff. It's all kind of wacky, nutty, teen, kid-oriented stuff, and it's it's you know it's fun-ish. Uh, Twenty-four episodes of uh, Nan Nan Biori, uh, which you know it's it's that that goofy, wacky. Uh, kind of pubescent uh, thing that they they enjoy enormously on Japanese television, and um, you know it gets silly, but it, you know I, I, it it I guess it's a thing. <laughs> uh, and then <laughs> with the wonderful title, Flip Flappers, the complete collection. Uh, this skews a lot younger. You got to probably be about, uh, I guess, ten or eleven to really immerse yourself in this one. Uh, this is all about, you know, teenagers trying to figure out what they're going to do when they grow up, and uh, it's 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 silly. Flip Flap is a um, is a secret organization uh, that is at the center of this thing, and it's what they use to sort of add a whole like. Uh, uh, a, kind of a genre footprint onto what's otherwise kind of basically just uh, silly Japanese teenager stuff. Uh, and then we get, uh, here we get another Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Super Part 3. This is episodes 27 through 39. Uh, nothing new here. It's just beautifully, beautifully rendered, nicely animated, but otherwise it's uh, it's more Dragon Ball, and they stick with they stick to their knitting. I'll tell I'll, I'll, that's that's for sure. They're really not taking any chances here. Um, nothing new, nothing uh, extravagant. Uh, it just uh, it just keeps on keeps on trucking. And now we get into the really really interesting stuff. Um, the uh, Akiba's Trip, the animation. These are all Blu-ray DVD combo sets, by the way, except for one. But uh, everything that I'm going to go through right now, they are, unless I tell you otherwise, assume that it is a Blu-ray DVD combo set. Uh, Akiba's Trip, the animation, is based on a game. And uh, this is, uh, it feels like it, frankly. Uh, it feels very, very gamery. Um the uh, and then it and then it veers into this vampire thing, um, where you're it's kind of like a part vampire superhero team dealing with the with this is set in the city of Akiba. Um, again, a little bit too too tied to the games. Uh, Tuken Ranbu Hanamaru, the first season, beautifully beautifully animated, futuristic uh, mythology it takes place in the year twenty two oh five. And uh, it's like projecting samurai culture into some kind of a dystopian future. Um, Like, let's say, kind of a super futuristic samurai Mad Max, in a way. Um, The the subject of history and revisionist history is really crucial to this. It's a very, very interesting concept, especially in Japan, where the the subject of revising their own history is is a subject of constant debate. Uh, That's Tukin Ranbu Hanamaru, the first season. Really a very, very interesting and incredibly well-animated show. uh, Monster Hunter Stories Right On, Season 1, Part 1. Yeah, this is this skew's kind of young, not really that interesting. Uh, It it, it thinks it's, you know, uh, like a human animal myth. You know, they do do those weird human-animal kind of hybrid things every once in a while. Yeah, it's not really, it's not not my scene, but I know some people are really into that stuff. Uh, very interesting is Izetta, The Last Witch, the complete series. That's I-Z-E-T-T-A. Uh, takes place in uh, right around uh, World War II time. And uh, it's, it's like, a, like a, uh, a fantasy, a supernatural fantasy set in the 1940s. I don't really uh, know any other way to, to 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 put it, but it's uh it's a re- it's a really it's fascinating, and uh, I I hope they can do more of this. It's really very well. It's very imaginative. It's very cool. It's got a very uh, very old school anime vibe to it. Uh, and then uh, the DVD, the only DVD of all of these, and I'm not sure why this is only on DVD and not Blu-ray, is uh, Scarred Rider. Uh, Gosh, I don't even know how to. How to, how to anyway, <laughs> I don't it's even here. We, the, the titles are sometimes insane. Yeah. I don't even know how to pronounce this. X E C H S. It's a capital X E C H capital S. Uh, this is a uh, this is kind of another mythological thing with young kind of young adults and teens who live in a uh, in a in a, a world called the Blue World, 
where they are um, under attack by Red World, and uh, there are different uh, different sort of psychobiological instincts between the two different races, and uh, these young the, the heroes have to somehow sort of uh, defend their world, and that's basically it. There's there's nothing else to it. It's a it's a very weird concept. It's kind of cyberpunky, kind of um, teen oriented, but it, it, you know, it, yeah, we'll see. Anyway. And then the uh, the last few here, uh, All Out Part One, which is just a, a rugby series. I don't know how anybody came up with the idea to do a rugby series on anime, but they did, and it's okay. Uh, I like rugby. I find rugby fascinating. I don't know that I'd want to watch it in anime. It's mm. weird. Uh, Keijo, the complete series. Now that's Keijo, not just Keijo, but Keijo, K E I J O, with seven exclamation points after it. <laughs> Keijo. That is literally the title. <laughs> the, the title has seven exclamation points. If you put oh. an eighth on there or if you miss one, uh, it's not the correct the, title. The internet will not know what you're talking about. The internet about. will not help you out. Uh, this is also a sports series, but it's a little it's a little more risque. Uh, these are... How do I put this? This is about a rivalry between boobs and butts. <laughs> Actually, that happens all the time in my neighborhood. Uh, yeah, see, yeah. so... Uh, that's really I'm I'm sorry. That's just yeah. basically all it is. Um, so it's it's uh, it's about a competition for boobs and butts, and and you know it's like it's like dodgeball the movie <laughs> except with girls and boobs and butts. I don't yeah, know. There's a strip club I hang out in there where that happens every <laughs> it's Tuesday a, it's a between st- six thirty. Strangest and stuff. Just the strangest stuff. Oh, and it. then and then uh, lastly, Attack on Titan gets a second season. Attack on Titan yeah. is awesome. The first season was amazing. It's it was some of the greatest anime in the, of the last 15, 20 years. And uh, really impressive stuff. I, they did a live action movie as well, which was less impressive. You're losing the anime dimension that kind of mm. takes you and transports you. But uh, second season is, is if you caught up on the first season, it's very Game of Thronesy in the sense that you really need to follow the continuity. Uh, second season is really awesome. And you get into the idea of where the Titan power comes from. And uh, it really starts to peel the layers of the of the uh, the uh, the uh, onion back a little bit. So uh, it's quite cool. This is a really awesome uh, limited edition box set. Comes with the uh, artwork and you know a digit book and a sixty page book uh, proper from WIT Studio. It's just really really impressive. And and if you if you love the, the the whole Attack on Titan thing, you will absolutely go nuts for this set. So good bunch of anime this week. Anime. Uh, so we'll go from anime to just plain old animation. Uh, American style hedgehogs. Um, interesting here, uh, hedgehogs, um, uh, voices, some of the voices, uh, well, I mean, a, lot, a lot of big voices in, in this film, but some of the voices include um, YouTube stars. Uh, the, the star, uh, uh, they're a young woman named Gen, Gen X Pen, and uh, the creators of this uh, YouTube series called Smosh. And then, of course, you have John Hitter and Chevy Chase and so more, you know. So, but it's interesting that the YouTube stars are identified that way. Yeah, uh, they say it's depressing. YouTube stars, and then they say yeah. their names, and then they will, you know, the rest of the actual yeah. professional acting cast, uh, which is an interesting thing. Anyway, uh, this is Hitchcock's Hitch, fairly cute little uh, animation uh, about a, a hedgehog named Bobby. Uh, uh, who splits from the wilderness and hits into the big city with his buddy, uh, and they, they hang out and do what they do, and they're real cute and cuddly. And you know, it's actually quite a cute and fun movie. Did yeah. Hero? No, 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 not her. Not her not no princesses. No, the the hedgehogs that showed up in the Ferdinand movie were all the rage in our house. We yeah. love those hedgehogs. These hedgehogs are not not at all. No uh, way. What are you gonna do? Sometimes you like the hitch. Obviously. <laughs> the Brit winner, um, uh, Academy Award nominee, that didn't quite make it over the you know, you know, uh, 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 the, fence with the with our group. Uh, with that, well, the yeah. Brit winner won our award. Oh, th- I'm sorry. Yeah. That's, that's right. Coco. Won a Coco. Coco did not make it yeah. over the edge with our group. Yeah, that was, you remember, that was the, that was, that a, big con- the thing made, was a bit of a controversy made, made in that Claudia moment. Cry. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the Brit winner won our award. But, uh, and, and you know what? Here's the thing. The, the the question ultimately came down. It was a little bit of a kind of a politically correct discussion over uh, not over which was the better film, yeah, but which sort of represented the more culturally significant uh, milestone. And yeah, uh, look, um, I think Breadwinner is the better film. 
Uh, Coco is very, very Pixar, and I, I think it's wonderful that, you know... Coco is a bigger film with a certain a sort of cultural significance, but of course the breadwinner is culturally significant too, the Afghan, bread, you know. Yeah, and, and the breadwinner is also the first ever feature animated film completely written, directed, and produced and about women. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is a it is a 100% female-driven thing. Uh, and, and With a narrative that speaks not only to little girls, but little brown girls in Afghanistan, little girl... Yeah. A little girl in Afghanistan, Afghanistan her father's uh, wrongly yeah. arrested. She has to dress up like a little boy yeah. in order to take care of her family and try to figure out a way to uh, reconnect with her father. Which, uh, so which that is, narrative is going on. Which is a similar narrative to the movie Osama, mm-hmm. which was uh, you know a, a cool little uh, Iranian movie of about 10 years ago or so, yeah. probably longer. A feature film. Feature not, film, yeah. a feature narrative, yeah. a live action film about a, about a girl who had to disguise as a boy to care for her family. So, I mean, there is... It, and both, and they're not ripping anything off. This yeah. actually happened and continues to happen throughout the region, yeah. and it is uh, it is a serious it is a serious thing that uh, sometimes women have to play these games to be able to support their families. Yeah, so it's yeah. a it's a and it's beautifully animated. Let's be fair. Yeah. It's a it's a touching Very story. Very simple animation. The exact opposite yeah. of Coco and yep. Pixar. This is so. This is. And there, and these are these are. And it's more than one kind of animation because there's a story going on within the stories. And these are Irish animators. These are these these women. Secret of Kells people. They 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 came from the 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 shop that did Secret of Kells. That's right. right. So it's Uh, wonderful. Nora Twomey. Uh, audio commentary with the filmmakers. Uh, a lovely, lovely film. Um, uh, and live action. Aliens ate my homework from a series of books. Aliens ate my homework. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, about a sort of inter- uh, intergalactic uh, uh, team of lawmen uh, made up by like middle schoolers. It's a really, really cute series. Cute series of books. Cute series of movies that I like quite a lot actually. Bonus features uh, include all kinds of neat stuff, uh, including getting on the set with Bruce Colville, who is the guy. Who who wrote the series of books in the first place? Yeah, uh, which is kind of neat. Thor Ragnarok, uh, well, Ragnarok, Ragnarok. Yeah. You know, a lot of people like this a little bit more than me. You know, as these things go, I suppose it's fine. <laughs> uh, so, but I'm a little bit over the Shakespeare for Dummies sort of yeah. quality of this of these <laughs> of these Thor movies. You know. They do have a bit of that. There was, I forget who it was, email us at gods at digigods.com. I forget who it was on the Facebook page, but somebody made a very, very fun comment when the first trailer dropped for this and and, and said, uh, ooh, they poured a little bit of Guardians of the Galaxy on my Thor. <laughs> and I thought, that is exactly what this movie yeah. is. And that's exactly what it turned out to oh, be. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, so here's my vibe on, on Ragnarok. Uh, I like the Thor movies. I loved the Thor comic books when I was a kid. Yeah. The Thor movies represent a bit of a different thing. Um, but a similar thing, and and Ragnarok is a big deal in the comic books, uh, a bigger deal than than here. Look, um, Kate Blanchett is awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, in that in that trailer when she did what she does yeah. to the hammer. Yeah. I'm like, Kate, wait a minute. Kate Blanchett is awesome, and uh, Jeff Goldblum is. Yeah. Just awesome. I I don't know why he doesn't show up in every single movie. If I <laughs> honestly, if I'm a studio head, I want Jeff Goldblum in every single movie I make. He's mm. just great. He's just great. He brings it every single time. And uh, on balance, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, the it's just it, it's it's minor Marvel in many respects. It doesn't uh, it doesn't advance their whole. You know this this mega narrative yeah, that they're everything pushing, running toward the everything Infinity is, Wars. Yeah, it doesn't to the Infinity Wars. Yeah. It's a bit of a detour from that, and uh, it's a, it's a bit of a gaudy one. But I had fun with it. What it you, looks great on 4K. Uh, and thus the deleted scenes and the gag reel and more and more and more and more and more everything you could possibly think of. So there you go, Thor yeah. Ragnarok. Where are we going? Okay, well, we we got a ton of foreign here that uh, has kind of accumulated over a little bit of time. So I'm going to start off, and I'm going to make mention of the... I, I know some weeks ago I mentioned about my uh, efforts to use Google Translate to be able to buy a Blu-ray from a... Uh, uh, from a, a Finnish site. So my efforts to purchase a Blu-ray from a site in Finland that has an, a <laughs> single word of English on it, they, they prevailed. It took me forever to do it, but I was finally able to do it. Thank you, PayPal. PayPal made it possible. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I really don't know what... I haven't looked at the extras on this yet. I don't know what they are. This is all in Finnish, and uh, it's one of the most difficult languages in the world. No subtitles? 
As Philip, no, there's subtitles. Oh, good. As Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, that much I can tell. I, I know that where it says here, uh, Kelly Suomi. That means <laughs> subtitles. And then the only word that I, I, don't, I don't know what the first one is. Uh, I know the second one, Ruotsi, is Russian. Ah. And I'm assuming that Englanti means English. Englanti, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yes. So, we get Lots. English subtitles on this. Uh, the movie is Talvi Sota which uh, is kind of legendary from 1989 in that in 1989, uh, Talvi Soda set a record that is still unsurpassed of having bought more Academy Award advertising in the trades, mm. Variety and Hollywood Reporter, than any other movie in history. Mm. It was every day. Mm. I don't know how many millions the Finnish government spent the Finnish film industry, but it was every day. There was a little, it was, they were small, yeah. but every day. Talvo Soda, for your consideration, best foreign language film, every single day. And of course, it did not get the nomination. No. So that was all money wasted. However, Talvi Soda is a, a, an extraordinarily powerful film. Uh, it's over three hours long. It's about three hours and 15, 20 minutes long. And uh, it is the story of the Winter War, which is what yeah. Talvi Soda means, uh, which is when uh, the rest of the world was focused on Hitler invading Poland and Czechoslovakia and France. Uh, Stalin figured nobody would give a damn if he sent his troops across the border into Finland because who cares about Finland? Everyone's, uh, you know, they're, they, they, their eye is on Hitler. Yeah. And, uh, and this is early. This is the late 30s. 39. Yeah, it's, 39. About, it's 39. Yeah. And uh, it, is, it is truly uh, a gut-wrenching movie. It's basically about these two brothers who go to war. And uh, I, I will tell you nothing about it, but it is—it is just such a powerful film. The first time I saw this, which was that year, '89. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I saw all the ads in the trades, and I thought, well, damn it all, I gotta go to see this thing because it's now playing, you know, three more days in Century City. And uh, so I went over on like the second or third last day of its run in Century City for Academy qualification. And uh, I all three hours and fifteen some minutes, and I went down into my car and I sat there and uh, I and I cried for like ten minutes. Wow. It just it was just it just it is it's so devastating what what they went through. It's it's a really powerful film. So has not been properly released anywhere outside of Finland. Uh, but this is a four K. Uh, remaster and God bless them. Uh, thank goodness. The, so this this beautiful, fantastic Blu-ray. Um, if you can go to the uh, the Finnish website and uh, I think I might post something on Facebook about this. But if you can go there and you can figure it out, I really highly recommend it. But this is not a, it's not it's a it's an import. So there it is. Oh man. Uh, White Sun uh, was in the running. Yeah, it was for a moment, wasn't it? We got uh, sent a screener on this. Uh, quite powerful. Two brothers uh, in uh, Nepal uh, facing all kinds of trials and tribulations as they try to have a funeral for their father. Um, it, it's basically just a portrait of post-Civil War Nepal. Uh, and just like what you were talking about with, with uh, Tal Vasoda, yeah. a powerful film. Uh, and, and, but mostly because these are children, these are little kids that we're talking about. Yep. Uh, all the more powerful because of that. Uh, uh, so anyway, a neat movie. Um, uh, on here, not a whole lot. It's just a film. We don't have any special. Uh, no. But uh, yeah. Pretty Academy, bare bones. Uh, Academy Awards nominated uh, for Best Foreign Language Film. Uh, Nepal's selection. Yeah. But their, their official they, submission. Their official yeah. selection, but didn't make it. Yeah. So Arrow Academy has really come on strong, and it looks like they want to give Criterion a run for their money here. Uh, they, we have we have three pretty impressive uh, Arrow Academy releases. Now remember the usual, the regular Arrow releases are the are the uh, the the more genre films. Arrow Academy is more legit. Arrow Academy is a is a separate line, specifically oriented toward the Criterion level stuff. The first one here is uh, the Witches. Uh, which is this fascinating collaboration between uh, five directors, including Vittorio De Sica, Lucino Visconti, and uh, Pierpaolo Pasolini. The other two are uh, Mauro Bologna, Bolognini and Franco Rossi. Uh, Franco Rossi certainly no slouch himself, but the big the big names here, you know, are De, De Sica, Visconti, Pasolini. and Pasolini. Yeah. Uh, and and a lot of these movies happened in the '60s, where you had you know these these collaborations. And uh, we're going to talk about another one here in a, in a moment that kind of sort of goes along the same, uh, in the same vein generally. 
But the uh, the idea here was that, uh, and this is Dino De Laurentiis is doing. Dino De Laurentiis was before he came to Hollywood. He was you know big cheese, yeah, multi Oscar yeah. nominated Italian producer, and he decided to bring together all of these great directors and do one of these legendary '60s anthology films. De Sica, I think, did three or four of these anthology films total. Um, and uh, the idea is that every single one of these stories was about a witch. Mm-hmm. And in every single episode, the witch would be played by Silvana Magnano. And that was it. That's yeah. the linking mechanism. Yeah. So uh, I you, always love those. Films. It's really yeah. interesting. They did a new 2K restoration on this. And uh, it's gorgeous, and it's a fantastically beautiful Blu-ray. And uh, this is the first time that we've had the English language version here as well. Uh, so you know, which is which is saying something that's never been released in any form whatsoever. So uh, pretty cool stuff. The uh, the uh, the anthology film, The Witches, with Silvano Silvana Magnano. Uh, then we also have. Gadar plus Gorin, five films, uh, 1968 to 1971. These are the, the uh, this is an extraordinary box set, and I really recommend it even if you aren't a Gadar fan. Uh, I'm not a Gadar fan. Gadar mm-hmm. gives me. I in- was always, you know, I'm nuts about it. I know you are. Sure. Gadar gives me indigestion. <laughs> uh, but there are, the, you know, he's a, he's a huge contributor to the history of film. You can't well, deny yeah, that. Coming out of that period, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just uh, really impressive. So uh, after Weekend in 1967, uh, Gadar wanted to get more politically. He wanted his films to be more politically uh, uh, involved and more pro- politically evocative. And he tried to invent, it's a bit of a, his, his version of like a political dogma movement. Um and this became a, 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 a kind of a, a strange collaboration with uh, Jean-Pierre Gorin, who is not a filmmaker, who's a who's a, pol- politi- who's a, a political journalist and an activist at the time, and uh, they they formed this dogma-like group called the Group Zigavertov, named for the the Russian uh, the Russian which means spinning top, the Russian mm-hmm. uh, avant-garde uh, filmmaker. So the the films that came out of that collaboration are um, kind of interesting. Uh, the there's a film like any other, uh, British Sounds, otherwise known as See You at Mao, uh, Wind from the East, Struggles in Italy, and Vladimir and Rosa. Uh, the uh, there I in a way I almost think these films. Um, defeat themselves a little bit. They're shot in 16 millimeter, and they're very raw and rugged and very Godardian in mm. all of those ways. But they they sometimes fee- feel a little bit too clever and cute by half. Like mm. they're more interested in making a cute film than in actually treating the subject in a in a penetrating way. Mm. So you know, for example, uh, Vladimir and Rosa is reporting on the Chicago Eight on the trial of the Chicago Eight, but it's all done in kind of a weird kind of satirical way that sort of undermines the reportage so you don't really like well what's the point you're just being you know i I, are you just being like just being a brat uh and in many respects godard is a brat but um you know that's sort of where it goes the uh the most interesting of all of them is a film like any other which deals with the may 1968 uh up uprising and uh, then the probably I'd say the least interesting for me at least would be uh, Wind from the East, which is very very didactic and kind of boring and much more like Gadar's more recent films. So, uh, but as a you know as a as a piece of history, this is quite interesting, and uh, I would recommend that anybody who wants to understand this momentary blip in Godard's career and in certainly in, in French uh, cinema, y- this is really, really educational. And it, uh, it dovetails into a lot of other interesting things from the era. So Godard plus Gore in five films, 1968 to 1971, box set from uh, Arrow. And then the last Arrow title here, uh, which is my favorite of the week, is uh, Viva l'Italia by Roberto Rossellini. Which was uh, made. This is kind of a you know he, uh, Rossellini was commissioned by the Italian government uh, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the modern state of Italy uh, to make a biographical film about uh, Garibaldi, and uh, which is you know sort of the, the Garibaldi is like the father of modern Italy in many respects, and uh, so this is a nice big opulent colorful epic, 
and uh, has all of Rossellini's uh, trademark flourishes in it, but beautifully, beautifully restored from the original negative. And um, this has never, ever been released in the United States mm. in any form whatsoever since it was originally released as a film. Mm. Tons of extras here. Really, really great extra collection. Uh, there's a, uh, a new interview with Rossellini's assistant, uh, Ruggiero, Ruggiero Deodato, which was made specifically for this release. Um, a visual essay on uh, Garibaldi by uh, Tag Gallagher, who wrote uh, The Adventures of Roberto Rossellini, the book. And uh, there's even a, a like a reversible sleeve. If you don't like the picture that's on the cover, you can flip it around and get a different picture. <laughs> it's pretty it. great. So that is a that's a beautiful Blu-ray of Viva l'Italia by Roberto Rossellini. Really good stuff. Uh, Louis Malle's Elevator to the Gallows. I think he was about 24 yeah. when he made this. I uh, love this, this movie. This film, this beautiful Jean Moreau. Of course, neat movie uh, 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 about a couple having a, uh, an, an affair and they decide to kill the boss. Classic story. Yeah, you know. classic noir. Yeah, classic noir and, story. And, you know, there's some question. This is the Criterion Blu-ray, I should yeah. point out. Uh, yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, some debate as to where this falls in the new wave period because Louis Mall is not a new wave, wave director. director. Yeah. yeah, this is 1958, which is a little late. It's, it's Well, it's just right there. Yeah, in that moment, and the question is: Is it do we include it or do we not include it as as, as a new wave film? Yeah, just because he wasn't with the other guys, it still has a lot of new wave stuff to it. Yeah, these, uh, yeah, in terms of those those elements to look, but it looks more like noir. Yeah, it uh, looks more like straight up noir. Then it has that great Miles Davis score in it too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Anyway, beautiful, beautiful film, uh, and, and Jean Moreau, of course. Yeah. You know. Uh, with that smile, 1958. Uh, this is full of all kinds of wonderful things on the Blu-ray special edition, special features, uh, uh, 2K digital restoration, uh, and everything else, uh, including uh, a lot of stuff from that score that you were just yeah. talking about, and and, and uh, trumpeter, uh, 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 a program from the 2005 score featuring trumpeter uh, John Thaddeus. So it's just a fabulous thing. Uh, Criterion Collection is what this is. Elevator to the Gallows. In the Shadow of the Women, a Philippe Garrel film. This is a re really neat movie from uh, oh, a year or so ago that, uh, that I, I had a chance to see. Lovely, beautifully done movie. Basically, it's a love triangle film. You have this uh, this couple uh, with a fairly fragile marriage. He's making a documentary film. Uh, another woman comes to work for them. He starts to have an affair with her. He's fairly cold and and distant from both of them, and then the wife and the other woman start to get involved in their own thing. Uh, it's really quite wonderful. Uh, a neat uh, neat little movie here. Uh, not a whole lot on it from Icarus Films. Blade of the Immortal. Mm. Takashi That was Mike. fun. A, a I, heck of a movie, you know. <laughs> it's uh, it's, uh, out, it's insane, fashion. like all his stuff. Yeah, you know, you have this immortal uh, samurai uh, who, uh, yeah, he, he did something, and now he's immortal, and the only way he can get soul back is if he goes out and does good deeds. Good deeds usually involve killing somebody for somebody else, <laughs> which is always interesting to me. That's a good deed. He has this woman, the woman in red, uh, who he, he becomes her protector, and he has to go out and try to... Uh, uh, avenge her. Her parents were killed early. It's just a, you know, it's Takashi. You, you know, what are you going to do? It's crazy. Uh, cast interviews and a whole bunch of other neat stuff on uh, this uh, DVD. Uh, Olive has com has gotten hold of three really great Spanish films, and uh, it's really interesting. Uh, it's an interesting collection. Three three different films, three different directors. Uh, the one I will make mention of first is the one that people have uh, probably not heard of because it was never released theatrically here. It's called The Red Squirrel by Julio Medem. Julio Medem has had other films that got released here. But uh, The Red Squirrel never was, and that's a little weird. I was at Cannes in 1993 yeah. when this was being sold, when it was made and it was being sold, and it was a big deal, and I remember it was announced that there was going to be an American remake of The Red Squirrel because it had one of those real twisty, turny, uh, mystery, thriller, vertigo-like uh, Hitchcockian plots. Yeah. Somebody's going to commit and, suicide or something. Yeah, and it, and it never went anywhere. It's, it's funny. That remake never happened. Uh, but that was in 93, and it was a big deal. And everybody was going to, oh, yeah, it's going to happen. And, of course, it all starts with, uh, with a guy who's about to jump from bridge and commit suicide when he is rescued by uh, someone and it is and and that rescue then precipitates a whole series of cascading events that make you wonder about everything everyone's motives and you know what what may or may not be intentional in an accident 
and and uh, it, it it goes into some really really fascinating um, issues about you know memory and uh, mm. uh, what you can and can't trust and whom you can and can't trust and it, it's really it's 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 a it's a little bit it's a little bit convoluted but the mechanics of it actually wind up working very very bril- uh, quite brilliantly so um, you know it, it it is absolutely Hitchcockian in all the best possible ways it's called the Red Squirrel on Blu-ray a Julio Medem film from Olive. The other two, Hamon Hamon, uh, with Penelope Cruz and Javier Bardem. I think that might be my first Penelope Cruz movie, maybe. Well, my my first first is the other one from the same year. Yeah. But, of course, you know, they are now married. Penelope Cruz and Javier Bardem uh, made this movie together, and then it took them forever to finally figure out maybe we should actually be together. They were students in, in, in school. Do they go back that they far? Do. They do. They go it's, it's way back. a whole back. little tiny group there, yeah. Took forever. But it is uh, It is really re- – this is just – the chemistry here is remarkable. They are both so young and so tremendous. He, of course, has aged quite well and gracefully. She has not aged at all. No. I don't know what they – I don't know what it is. It's the paella. Oh I don't God. know. But yeah. it's unbelievable. Uh, and this is directed by Bigas Luna. I know it's the big joke. <laughs> you said big ass. I get it. Yeah, big ass movie. But um, because Luna made, has made a lot of fine films, including the uh, the Ages of of uh, Lulu, which was supposed to be released here and uh, never was, and that's a bit of a scandalous book as well. Uh, but anyway, it's it, this is it, this just you know it, it, this is wonderful and funny and romantic and sexy and uh, you're watching this basically just to watch these two amazing actors have just a, a great deal of fun with each other and their chemistry is just so beautiful. But the film that I really want to recommend most highly is the one that was my first Penelope Cruz movie. And yeah. that is Belle Epoque. Oh, the same yeah, year, of course. 1992. Of course. Uh, Belle Epoque went on to win the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film, uh, written and directed by uh, Fernando Treba. And uh, Treba, I interviewed at the time, and mm. I remembered very well, and uh, he, is, he is nothing if not a gigantic Billy Wilder fanatic. And that shows when you watch the film because this has Billy Wilder written all over it. Uh, it take pla- takes place in 1931 in, and you've got you know on, just right on the cusp of the Spanish Civil War. And uh, it's about a young soldier who decides he just doesn't want to fight anymore. So he goes AWOL and he winds up uh, basically, uh, being taken in by this guy and his family with you know, his four daughters, all of whom see the young soldier as fresh meat. Yeah, and it is just so charming and so funny and so wonderful and so romantic and so Billy Wilder esque in every conceivable way. And the recreation—it's just Treba has made so many fine films, but this is one of his very best, and Beautiful it's the one that won him the Oscar. And I love this movie. I love it. And you know what, Penelope Cruz is to die for in this movie. First thing I ever saw her in, and the first thing I thought was, she's a star. Oh, my That's God. That's it. She's yeah. a star. Yeah. So, fantastic movie. Belle Epoque on Blu-ray from Olive. They don't Beautiful. make them anymore. They don't make movies like that anymore. They don't. They don't. You know, it's so upsetting. The, 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 uh, Hamon Hamon, for the, either, for that matter. I know. They, they, they don't really Sad. make either one of those movies anymore. Uh, Kontrolovsky's, um, Kontrolovsky's Paradise. This made my top ten. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, powerful powerful movie. Uh, Tremendous uh, Holocaust movie. movie. Olga, beautiful. All black and white. All black and white. A beautiful Russian countess uh, who's fighting for the French resistance, fighting for the resistance. She gets into a concentration camp. Uh, you know, um, it's uh, she runs into this young German SS officer who knew her, who was in love with her from from back when, and everything that sort of grows out of that connection, and everything. It's just an absolutely stunning film. It's uh, it's a it, a lot of interesting uh, perspectives here. The, the 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 way it's all done, sort of through interviews of these characters, and the way that their perspectives do and don't necessarily correspond and don't mix and match, and uh, the fascinating role of um of russians in, in the french resistance it, 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 there's a history here there's an underlying history that i didn't even know and uh i it's just really it's a powerful film it's one of konchalovsky's very very best particularly russian aristocrats yeah which was an which actually makes sense when you think about it yeah it, that a russian aristocrats would be a part of the resistance uh, to absolutely the, yeah it, of it, course it makes, makes total sense, sense. Yeah. Yeah. and uh, if you were a czarist you don't need stalin and this was at venice and this was a big deal at venice 
And I keep hoping that uh, Film Movement will release a Blu-ray of this because it's all out only on DVD, and it really just screams for Blu-ray because the, 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 the black photography yeah. is just so gorgeous. Uh, I got some, uh, got some Asian theme stuff here. Uh, mostly, it, well, it's all Chinese. Uh, so let me go through this pretty quickly. It's all Hong Kong and Chinese, some better than the other. The 2016 directing debut of Johnny Ma, um, called Old Stone, is uh, is is a it's a stylistic film. It's uh, extremely well put together. Uh, I don't know if it's ultimately quite as successful as it should be. Uh, basically, deals with a, uh, a a taxi driver who uh, winds up falling into this completely bizarre labyrinth of. A little bit like uh, uh, the the uh, Scorsese film, um, uh, bringing home, bringing no the dead? with with uh, no the the uh, the night uh, after hours. Oh, after hours, yeah, early Scorsese. Yeah, it's very after hours ish, uh, and then it turns really dark and weird and becomes a little bit like U turn at a certain point. So yeah. it's like after hours meets U turn in China with a taxi driver. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. Paul Schrader, um, Stone, Martin Scorsese. Yeah, yeah that's all of that. Man. Yeah, well. Well, anyway, that's basically what this is. Uh, it, uh, it, it it gets a little bit too dark for me at a certain point. I'm not sure I buy all the conceits, but it's still very stylish and nicely done. Old Stone by Johnny Ma. Legend of the Naga Pearls is freaking nuts. Uh, this is such a bizarre fantasy. I don't even know where to go. I love Wuxia, as anybody knows, but I don't love this movie. Uh, the This is all about a, a mythical quest for these... Uh, Naga pearls um, that may hold the key to destroying people, and I just, I, I you know, the it, it gets into all kinds of weird characters borrowed from Chinese ghost story and uh, a, a lot of wire work and other mythological conceits that don't make any sense at all. I, I don't. It's just this really, really went way over my head, and I'm, <laughs> I'm accustomed to this genre anyway. The legend of the Naga pearls. It's a lot of style over substance. Um, Brotherhood of Blades 2, The Infernal Battlefield, is a sequel, sequel to Brotherhood of Blades. Not as good, but also not bad. Uh, it could have been a complete disaster. Uh, Liu Yang directed it, does a very, very good, solid job. It's, uh, it, it, technically, this is a prequel. Mm -hmm. It takes place before, but, it, you know, I, it, if you haven't seen the other one, it still stands alone, and uh, it'll, it'll, it'll still work. Um, don't, I don't think it was really a necessary film to make, but it, it's it's fine. It's well acted and it's nicely mounted, and uh, nothing really to complain about. And then, uh, lastly, is uh, the middling extraordinary mission, which um, I wish I could like more than I do, to be honest. Uh, this is directed by Alan Mock and Anthony Pyun. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's you know a, a kind of a generic uh, police action thing. Uh, the only thing that they're trying to use to sort of give this a, a little bit of a boost is that um, Andrew Lau, who is of course the very fine director who did the Infernal Affairs trilogy, was producer on this, but that doesn't really bleed over. Uh, it just doesn't it doesn't quite work. Uh, it, 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 I guess he, it's a, we could probably describe it as being the same vein as Heat as far as American films. It has, a, it has some things in common with Infernal Affairs, which of course was remade here as the Oscar winning The Departed, but is not, which is not as good as the original Infernal Affairs films. Yeah. Um, I've always thought that too. Yeah, not even close. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, you know, you get, you get a lot of this uh, cat and mouse stuff that, you know, John Woo and Ringo Lam have done repeatedly. It, it's, it just recycles a lot of cliches. It's more about the action and the plot, and you can tell. The plot just isn't, it's a, it's a little bit threadbare. But, you know, uh, extraordinary mission. If you're, if you're a genre fan, you'll probably enjoy it. Ah, uh, well, let's see here. Um, Viva la Liberté, uh, long, long Live Freedom. I love this movie. It was absolutely hysterical. Robert Andando film, Tony, Tony Cervillo in this film. Yeah. It's just so funny, so full of fun. Even the, even the plot is funny. Here's the plot. Very important politician goes missing. Uh, his underlings think to replace him with his twin brother, who, as it happens, is insane. Man, the Iron Mask. <laughs> <laughs> 
is. And Tony, Tony Servillo plays plays the crazy twin brother. And, it, and, 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 and even the tagline is great. Power is madness. Uh, now, yeah. to me, I'm sorry. That's a fi- why hasn't anybody adapted that? I don't know. That sounds great. You know, it, yeah. It, it, but it's it, Tony Servillo, of course, is a very, very funny Italian actor. He goes way back. So it, it's a really, really neat, uh, a very funny film. Uh, that uh, you should check out. Uh, this one doesn't have a whole lot on it. It's just out of the movie, but the movie stands for itself. Ms. A Zombie is a zombie movie, Japanese zombie movie. I love this movie. Uh, uh, concept of this movie by Sabu. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, sort of a cult Japanese uh, Sweet. Uh, uh, film. Sweet. Con- concept of this movie. Uh, rich people can buy zombies to work as <laughs> maids and <laughs> servants. <laughs> and to sort of depends on you know, the, the, the degree of the zombie That's inspection and how, and how aggressive the zombie will be. But when you get your zombie kit, it does come with a gun. So, you know, just in case the zombie gets out of control. Neat movie. A real sort of a Night of the Living Dead. Funny, sharp, bloody as heck. Uh, but, you know, zombies make such wonderful pets. Uh, two films really, really worth talking about here. One is Sunstroke by Nikita Mikhalkov who won an Oscar for Burnt by the Sun some years ago. Um, yeah. Now, we, we talked about Konchalovsky here earlier. Yeah. I always like to remind people, Nikita Mikhalkov and Andrei Konchalovsky brothers. are brothers. Yeah. Uh, long story as to why they don't have the same last name. <laughs> yeah. It's a, you know, one took mom's name and the other dad's name. It gets into Russian patronymics that never really makes sense to me. Yeah. But in any case, uh, this is, you know, I am not usually a Mikhalkov fan. I am a Konchalovsky fan. I love the fan. brother song, the son, though. See, uh, yeah. that didn't work for me. It yeah. was that little uh, glowing thing floating around, yeah. and I never really understood the symbolic nature. I didn't. It like I was like, "What is that thing? Is it? I don't. I don't understand." No, it didn't. It was a little bit too ma- magical realism. You, you never, know how you I am. Never, I'm you never, never care for magical. I'm just not into magical realism. But uh, th- uh, I quite like this film. This is one of his better films, and uh, I'm sorry this didn't really get as much traction as it should have. This was made in 2015. And was uh, it won? It was quite successful in Russia. It's all rooted in Russian history, right? To just before the uh, the revolution, and uh, deals with the with um, some some czarist soldiers who are in a prison camp, uh, and uh, it it's it it, it it takes the politics of the era, and it's actually able to sublimate it to this personal story in a way that doesn't feel preachy, that doesn't feel uh, obvious, and. Uh, Really, uh, quite quite powerful. Uh, the sunstroke of the title has nothing to do with Burnt by the Sun, so don't think that it's like a semi sequel or anything like that. Um, but it's uh, it, it's 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 quite a it's quite a provocative film. It's uh, you know the last thing that he did before that was Twelve, which was the Russian adaptation ah. of uh, Twelve Angry Men, yeah. which I thought was a little bit affected. But this is really he's getting much more back into a into a groove here, and it feels it feels more epic. It feels much more politically provocative. I wonder if the Sidney Lumet film will feel affected today. I mean, if it were made, to, it's been made twice, maybe yeah. three times even. Yeah, uh, you know that that, yeah. that that original film. But what felt so much like a verite at the day? It's all you know. Yeah, you know, Sidney Lumet was a photographer, a cinematographer, so he knew yeah. lenses and all that. And and I, and I watched it the other day. You know how I'm always watching yeah. the old television. I'm watching it. I'm, I'm loving this movie. Um, but I was thinking to myself, I don't think you can do this today. I don't think you can move that camera around that move and change the depth of field and the yeah. perspectives and and get away. Maybe, well, with all that maybe. live television stuff that he did too. You yeah, know, that's where. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh, the oldest profession. We talked about the anthology films of the uh, 1960s. This is another one, 1967. The oldest profession, which was an anthology film by get the name, get these directors here, uh, Franco Indovina. Michael Flegar, Mauro Bolognini. Never heard of any of those, no, have you? No. Now we get real. Claude Auton Lara, uh. who did the box set that uh, was released a few weeks ago by uh, Criterion. Philippe de Broca. de Broca. And last but not least, our good friend, out of his mind, Jean Luc Godard. <laughs> uh, and what a cat. You're telling me you didn't like the early Godard. Breathless, you, know, you didn't like. I, I, a I, woman I, is a woman. You didn't like those are just. I like a woman. I like a woman as a woman. Movies, yeah. I do like a woman. You know, Vivre sa vie. I, I, like, yeah. Yeah, I like. I like those. Uh, Breath- I mean, when he, when he gets behind her and he just leaves that. I mean, come on, that's Jean Luc. He it, thought of that. I know. I know. I. 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 I just. <laughs> He's such a crank. He is an you know, ass. He's, he's, he's just ass. such a crank. <laughs> he's uh, an ass. This is a guy who, you know, made... Wasn't, wasn't uh, King Lear a response to an angry phone call that he left for Harry Weinstein? <laughs> like Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> yeah. the, con- the phone call with Harvey Weinstein opens the movie. It's the weirdest <laughs> thing ever. 
Um, mm. But you know what? This is actually kind of a fun. Um, this is kind of a fun uh, uh, anthology. The the idea here is that they're basically making an anthology about prostitution through the ages. That's it. And uh, as long as we're we're going all in on the uh, the oldest profession, let's just have a lot of fun with our actresses. And who are we going to cast? Well, we're going to cast Raquel Welch first of all, and we're going to cast Jeanne Moreau yeah. again uh, second of all, yeah, yeah. and uh, Anna Karina of course because you know she was Godard's wife and has to be in everything that he does. And then you know Michelle Mercier and Nadia Gray and Elsa Martinelli, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. So uh, it's not a great film. None of the segments are going to win. Uh, you, you know, they're not going to be remembered as any of the best work that these directors did, but they're awfully, awfully fun. So, uh, and to be honest, the, the best one here, as far as I'm concerned, is not by any of the A-list directors. It's Michael Flager's The Gay 90s with uh, Raquel Welch. Uh, which I thought was just absolutely uh, h- hilarious, and and it's not. I should say it's not um, s- about prostitution per no, se, no. but it's it's a it's about prostitution in concept. Yes. So it's a it's an it throws an interesting twist on all these stories. It's not just like a bunch of stories about no, hookers. It's not just about it's, women, women, women. it's about you know when we prostitute ourselves. ourselves every, you know yes, that yes, that's yes. the question is what is prostitution? And it ain't always the gals. Yeah, it's yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, Heal the Living, um, which is an interesting film, uh, quite quite moving actually. Uh, three seemingly despaired uh, stories uh, that tie together. A young man uh, dies in a car accident. Yep. Uh, his family has to make a decision about uh, about transplants and what their decision will mean to the other people whom they do not know in the story, but whom we get to meet uh, is what this movie is about. And it's, and it's really quite from Cohen Media. Um, an excellent, excellent movie uh, with an interview from the director. How do you say? How do you say that director's name? Uh, the director's Hale. name, Catel Kilaver. Kilaveré. Kilaveré. Wow, that's a tough one to pronounce. Yeah, that is. That is. That's like old French something or other. I knew you could do it. And then Quentin um, Flas is uh, if the you know if look Quentin Flas is a legendary figure, a legendary uh, Mexican actor who uh, probably is most well known here for uh, his part in the 1956 Best uh, Picture winner Around the World in 80 Days, the Michael Todd monstrosity that also has the nerve to cast uh, uh, <laughs> Shirley MacLaine as an, as an Indian princess. Oh, yeah. That just, you know, I, that movie is so not good, and it wasn't good <laughs> then, uh, but David Nevin kills it, and it was the first you know, widescreen film to win Best Picture, so it's, it's uh, historically significant. Anyway... Content Floss made a lot of movies that uh, yeah. still kind of they're they're all cheesy they're all but you know look what's I, his, what's his equivalent his uh, equivalent gosh, in, in, I mean you know in America I would just, be would be uh, what that's a great it's question like he, he's like all three of the three Stooges yeah uh, he's like uh, both Laurel and Hardy he's like all three of the Marx brothers he's like all three of the Marx brothers yeah he's just you know? uh, it, I wouldn't say he's Jerry Lewis because he's a little too sweet and cute and endearing yeah you know in a way but that might even be in a, that might even be something of an apt analogy anyway uh, from Mill Creek, we have a couple of double features here. We have uh, the two films, uh, Conserje on Condominio and uh, Por Mi Pistolas, together on one. And I know my Spanish is just being horrible. sounds awful. And then on the other is um, El Barrendero and Gran Hotel on the other double feature. Uh, you know what? Uh, Gran Hotel might be the best of all of these. Yeah. It's the one that that feels he's younger. Uh, it's uh, it, it's more. It made in 1944, and it it's kind of you know more endearing in the way that he always was. The other films were were made later, uh, 60s and 70s, and and he just he's kind of losing a step, and the movies aren't quite as uh, as good. But still, you know, Content Floss, if you're a fan and you want to see how his career evolved and try to figure out a little bit why he was so popular, which <laughs> mystifies some people, uh, you got a couple more double features out from Mill Creek. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, a little television? Yeah, let's hit some TV. Uh, the first season of MacGyver, of course, the new MacGyver. Oh, uh, God. This MacGyver. Uh, I got to tell you, um, you know, knocked off one or two of these when it, uh, when it first, because, you know, I'm a MacGyver guy from the 80s. Sure. Uh, uh, Richard Dean uh, Anderson. Um, uh, who went on, by the way, to, to, to make just as many of those Stargates. 
Uh, this, I know. This guy crazy, is rich right? like three times over. He, he, the, the, the MacGyvers, uh, four or five. I mean, the, the people yeah. who make money in this town who are TV. really – It's TV. the television people. Yeah. You know, we, we always think yeah. movie stars. It's not. Um, anyway, uh, so, I, so I watched this. It's, 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 it's more like the A-team than MacGyver – uh, was you know on 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 television? Uh, it, 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 he's not really working by himself doing his things. It's, it's, it's a whole thing. But I suppose it's okay if you're into MacGyver. Alibi. Michael Kitchen. Love Michael Kitchen for one thing. This is a TV movie, a British TV movie. It's just about the darkest, funniest, uh, uh, trippiest little TV movie that you would ever want to see. Feature film quality. This movie. Uh, Sof uh, Sophie Okonedo and Phyllis Logan from, uh, I think she's in Downton Abbey, if I'm not mistaken, in Michael Kitchen, right? Yeah. All right, so like this, uh, this movie, this businessman throws his party for this guy. Uh, the, the, the family is there. His business partner is there. People are roaming around doing this, that, and the other thing. Um, he goes off back to the big house, right? Okay. A little bit later, uh, his wife comes to the big house and sees him moving the body of oh, his no. dead partner. Oh, no. And he's like, it's not what it looks like. <laughs> 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 and, and we're off to the... And, you know, it, and, and the thing of it is, it's not. And, and but but it is but yeah. it is something yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's something <laughs> but it ain't what it looks like and it's a hell of a it's a hell of a funny really really good uh, British television movie starring Michael Kitchen which there was more on here but uh, I'm, I'm afraid it's not three episodes put together it, it, so it's laid out in the three episodes as it was when it aired on British television yeah. Uh, East West 101 is an, uh, a really interesting Australian series. This is the first season, series one, of, uh, from Acorn of the Australian show, uh, East West 101, uh, which is about a, um, a Muslim uh, detective, a Muslim police officer. He works for the major crime squad in Sydney and how his life has obviously changed and his work has changed in the post-9-11 world. And um, that's especially interesting considering that, you know, 9-11 didn't, was not in Australia, but it obviously, the, rip, it, you know, the ripple effect carried across the, uh, the world, and it obviously now affects them there. And um, it's a really well-written well and incredibly well-acted show. Uh, the, it doesn't feel preachy. It's not trying to make a statement. It's just using that premise as a, uh, as a, as ground zero for some very interesting drama and character conflicts. And it's, uh, it's very, very sharp. I hope they don't try to, uh, remake it here in any way because it wouldn't work nearly as well. Yeah. Same thing with, with this one, Rebecca, uh, Martinson, uh, Swedish series. Yeah. Right. Uh, eight episodes uh, here. So this is a really, really neat series, but it depends on being set where it's set, which is not only in Sweden, but in the north of Sweden. Oh, yeah. In the winter, uh, when it's basically night uh, most of the time. What happens is a, a, a very successful young lawyer uh, who's in Stockholm doing her thing finds out that her childhood friend has died. She goes home to the north of Sweden, where she's from, and where she was glad to get the hell away from uh, as, as a young woman. And starts looking into the situation with her late friend and decides that it wasn't an accident and that it was a murder. Ooh. Uh, she's a lawyer. She contacts uh, uh, a, a, a police, uh, another childhood friend who now works for the police department. And these two ladies, these two women, that's what another interesting thing about these series, these two women set out to find out what happened to their childhood friend, actually. And it's a neat story, neat mystery, all of that. But most of it, a lot of it, has to do with the fact that w of where we are in Sweden, in the north of Sweden, uh, in this particular sort of place, so with all of the little glitches and quirks that comes along with being in a place where it's cold and dark almost all the time. Uh, a really interesting series from the uh, same people who created Prime Suspect is The Commander. Uh, I, I think this has really gained a lot of traction in the UK. First I've seen of it, uh, The Commander stars Amanda Burton as a woman who has now become the highest ranking woman in Scotland Yard. And she's, uh, she's, she runs the murder review team. Her actual title is, is one that I, I, I kind of had to laugh at. Uh, she, she is the um, group commander of the, well, she's the commander of the Serious Crime Group. Yeah. The serious crime group, <laughs> as opposed to as opposed to you know crimes that aren't so serious. Yeah, but these are this is that's a serious crime. What that what that guy do? Well, he he's serious crime. <laughs> oh, not, okay, it's not just murder. It's not. We better we better call uh, call the commander. <laughs> 
Uh, but anyway, it, of course, it is the murder review team, and uh, it's it, it's less about solving the crimes than it is about you know the fact that this is a very a, an incredibly ambitious and sometimes a little bit unhinged woman who is you know pouring herself into her job with reckless abandon. Yeah. And uh, Amanda, you know, Amanda Burton is really, really a great actress. I'm not that familiar with her apart from this. But um, boy, this was this is really this is terrific stuff. Um, this is the complete collection. This show ran uh, about ten years ago, and uh, so you see a lot of people show up in here who uh, you know who would go on to bigger and better things uh, from other shows and other movies. So there's, there's a lot of you know a lot of a lot of stuff in here. But anyway, it's a it's a great it's a great show. It's it airs now on Acorn TV as well. Uh, here, if you if you have access to Acorn TV, and um, continues to be enormously popular in the UK. So, um, anyway, it's a complete collection of The Commander, which is a kind of a nice uh, discovery. Yeah, I this series when it was on, I was more intrigued. The 1997 Robert Altman did a television series called Gun. Yeah, uh, the gun. The premise of the series, the conceit of the series, is that we would follow a single gun as it yeah. made its way. I remember the, that the hands of different people from each that. episode. Uh, just the one gun that, by hook or by crook, made its way into the hands of the person in the next episode, and and everything that sort of resulted from that. Love that concept, that premise. The other thing I liked about uh, this series, which was very short lived, uh, six film anthology. Uh, are the people that were in it whom I could pick out. Some of them were already movie stars or television stars, but some of them ha- weren't. James Gamble Fino uh, was not yet a... You know, the, yeah. you know Tony Soprano. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Johnny Whitworth was not just an important actor. But, you know, you had your Kathy Bakers and your James Edward James Almosis and your Maria Conchita. Fred Ward shows up. Ed Begley Jr. shows up. Christopher McDonald shows, shows yep. up. And, and one of the... Daryl Hannah, Martin Sheen shows up in one of these. And then... Among the six, you have your interesting directors. Of course, Robert Altman uh, directed uh, All the President's Women, uh, which is one of the episodes. But also here, you got James Foley. You got Ted Demi, the late Ted Demi. Uh, you've got Jeremiah Chechik. Uh, you got Peter Horton. Uh, directing episodes of this series, uh, produced uh, by Robert Altman. What I didn't like about these series was like the the actual uh, narratives of the stories. Most of them were not as captivating as captivating as I wanted them to be. Yep. Uh, so you know, uh, thus the short lived series. Nevertheless, it's a chance to see a lot of these actors and many many others. Uh, Randy Quaid and so many, uh, you know, from 20 years sure. ago, kind of doing their thing. Some of the young directors started coming up and uh, doing their thing. Neat series from the late Robert Altman. Gun, a six parts film anthology. And that takes us, as we close out, to some uh, classic movies, one of which is an Altman film, Altman's Images, uh, which is basically like Robert, Al- Robert Altman's version of Polanski's Repulsion. Yeah. Uh, is what Images is. Images is a it's a really cool film and one of one of the more interesting Altman films of the period. It was something that he'd wanted to do for many many years. This was apparently one of his uh, his very earliest ideas for a narrative film back when he was making you know industrial movies and industrial documentaries and stuff uh, in the sixties. This is something that he wanted. To, this sort of occurred to him. And it has a very counterculture psychedelic vibe to it. Uh, Susanna York plays a woman. A, a an author who's uh, who, who's pregnant and who thinks that her husband may be unfaithful and during a vacation that stress and obviously the stress of the pregnancy contributes to a breakdown in her psychological state and it gets all kinds of weird and cool and and, and funky. Uh, it's a really interesting film. This is from Arrow Academy. C- tons of extras on here. Uh, a really I, I'd forgotten what an amazing bunch of people worked on this. Yeah, this was the first film. Scored by John Williams and photographed by Vilmos Zygmunt. Oh wow! Of course, who would go on yeah. to do Close Encounters yeah. together, right? Yeah. And you know, you thought about that. It's like, wow, Altman working with uh, you Vilmos know and Vilmos John and Williams. John Williams. R- R- that, this is my first. I was thinking about it as you were speaking. I think it's my first time. Rene Aubergenois. Yeah, plays the husband. Plays the husband. Uh, who, of course, we know is Odo from yeah. Deep Space Nine, and and and, uh, and, and, and it's so many. I, I mean, T- know, tons of television. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, tall, skinny, blonde actor who yeah. you don't know. You, yeah. Who, who, of course, by the way, also is uh, is a voice in. Um uh, in uh, Little Mermaid. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. He's, you know, yeah. He's, but he's one of those actors who yeah, he's been just, around for forty-five yeah. years, forever, and we just don't, you know, think about him that much. But there he is. 
Yep, and uh, a lot of other people contributed to this as well. Stomu Yamashita, the great uh, Japanese composer who, of course, is best known from the, the group Go, mm. uh, and also from his amazing score for, uh, for uh, Paul Mazursky's Tempest. Stomu Yamashita was the sound designer on this thing, so it gets funky and weird, and mm -hmm. it's, all re it's, it's really quite a film. A lot of interesting extras on here. Uh, there's a select scene commentary recorded by Altman, obviously, when he was still alive. And another commentary uh, by a couple of film scholars, and it's it, it's it's a sharp sharp release. And then we also have from Arrow Video, as long as we are wrapping out with Arrow, uh, the the very disturbing film Scalpel. Yeah, uh, the Scalpel is a is a, a an exploitation film of sorts from the uh, the mid mid to late seventies, and uh, it is it is not a family film. Uh, let's just let's just let's just be very clear on that. Um, the, this is this is this stars Robert Lansing as a. Let, uh, this is probably more like what Cronenberg would have made Dead Ringers if he if he if he had a big a, a stiffer backbone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is what Dead Ringers probably should and could have been. Um, anyway, John Grismer is the director of this, who previously made a movie called Blood Rage. And it stars Robert Lansing as an absolutely out of his mind surgeon, uh, who is uh, trying to cope with the um, with a, a runaway daughter, and uh, you know a a, a crime. Oh, how do I how do I not reveal this? Mm -hmm. uh, his daughter's run away, and then there's a crime. I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. I won't tell you how, how any of this ties together. Um, but all of this creates a, a scenario that winds up being much more like Eyes Without a Face, the mm. famous French film, than anything else, except it's like an exploitation version of Eyes Without a Face, and uh, it's really creepy and weird. Mm. Uh, anyway, this was, uh, this was uh, I think, once upon a time, a bit of a drive-in movie, but uh, here it is. It's Scalpel. And boy, is it a is it a creep fest? Yeah, man, I'll say. Uh, and then we've got uh, another weird one from the the vaults, Black Eagle. Jinx Claude. This is from the uh, MVD Rewind collection, uh, which is great. I love that they put the stickers. They they like put the phony stickers that would have been on a VHS. It's really Back funny. When the movie was actually made. Yeah, they wanted to have that like dated look. Uh, so Jean-Claude Van Damme and Sho Kasugi, who basically did all of the really bad martial arts movies in the 1980s, um, came together on this utterly bizarre and not very good uh, actioner that is, it's just, it's really silly. Best thing in that movie is the F-111. Yeah, I mean, it's, well... The F-111 being, being, being the, the an plane, aircraft. Gets, which gets, shot, logs, which gets yeah. shot down in the Mediterranean, and then there's a whole, like, Cold War uh, race with the Russians that goes on, and, and you know, Van Damme is completely ridiculous. Uh, he plays a KGB agent <laughs> here. The first time that he played, you know, he would go on to play the... Uh, "Quote unquote Russian in uh, No Retreat, No Surrender," yeah. which is that really silly movie about the kid who's you know it's like who's coached by the ghost of Bruce Lee to defeat the, <laughs> which I love because he looks at him at one point and goes, "You Russian," and Van Damme gets uh, really irate. It's yeah, it's you know it's like Karate Kid meets uh, Rocky Four and with mm -hmm. all the worst possible ways. But in any oh, case, uh, this is a very very silly film. Uh, lots of extras here. You see this only if you have any kind of sentimental attachment to uh, Van Damme and Kasugi from their, their early days, but uh, it's not anyone's finest hour here. I wonder if Van Damme still has that series. Oh, he may. Oh, he, may. He, he may. He may still got that series. It's, uh, it's really let's see here. Uh, We've got... Manhattan Murder Mystery. I'll do it just because oh, I, yes. I got it. My Alan Alda, Woody Allen, Angelica Houston, Diane Keaton in Manhattan Murder Mystery. Fantastic. Just absolutely fantastic film. Um, that is probably probably coming. Up, we're coming up up on the. This would be near the end of that really great run that Woody had toward the in the middle nineties. Yeah, that included the crime, your crimes and misdemeanors. You yep. included your uh, Hannah and her sisters, uh, husbands and wives. It's just that that that, that, that it's amazing, amazing run. period. That, that, amazing that amazing run. run. We Z forget about Z it Zelig. You know. Yeah, you throw Zelig. Zelig in there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it starts about starts about 1990 and runs through about two two. You know, I, I think I, I think we could start about 85. You could start yeah, about 85 because I, I always take a break at September. Uh. Uh, which, as a movie that I like more, we're, we're talking about doing a, a wonderful book Good series. Point. We're talking yeah. about that's going to be one of the movies that I've reconsidered. 
yeah. uh, from when I wrote it. But I, I used to take a break at September because I didn't I, I didn't care for that. Yeah. Uh, and then it was a hard shift for Woody too. That was right. a hard shift, you know. It was. And then yellow rose, purple rose, purple rose, purple rose. And and then I'm like, okay, now we're back on track and we have yeah. that run. Yeah. Uh, and and I think and it ran through about this <laughs> yeah. movie here, and then it was kind of over for a while, and then it started up again with a little My- run. My favorite thing in Manhattan Murder Mystery is is Alan Alda yeah. and Diane Keaton um, sitting in that car <gasps> on their stakeout, their amateur stakeout. Yeah, and they and they and there's it's all silent. There's no dialogue. It's a one of the it's a great Woody Allen moment with no dialogue, and they're sitting there and they look at each other. And they're like little kids in a candy store. And Alan Alda gets this just wry grin on his face. He could not be happier because he's playing detective. Yeah, It's the cutest thing in the world. It is so sweet and so funny. And the look on his face is just so – it's priceless. It's, it's, it's his best moment in And movies. this might be the last time that I – and again, I'm being real loose in my memory now – that I remember Woody because Woody's in the movie. Yeah. And, and him being good. Yeah. As an actor, yeah, you for know, sure. it, it, as opposed to a little bit later when he gets a little bit older, he still puts himself in a movie too, Hollywood, yeah. and he, you know, whatever. And he's yeah. a little wacky, he's a little shaky, and he's yep. a little, and he rambles on a bit. But in this movie, he's hitting his mark, he's hitting his lines. Yeah, he, it's you know. So there you go, uh, an underrated. You know what? I'm gonna have to put this one. Oh, it's gonna go on my list. I just, I just realized this is going on my list. <laughs> <laughs> All right, whatever. Anyway, uh, yeah, so right. that's that's from Twilight Time, and we've got three more from Twilight Time as well, which are all. Freaking gems this week. Um, TwilightTimeMovies.com, by the way, is where you go for these. TwilightTimeMovies.com. Uh, the other one's Harry and Walter Go to New York, which is uh, a Mark Rydell film from yeah. 1976, and it is an absolute and total complete gem. Uh, Diane Keaton is in this the year before she became Annie Hall. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is... This is basically kind of a Laurel and Hardy-esque pairing of Elliot Gould and uh, James Caan, who, of course, were in their prime at this time, as was Diane Keaton. Uh, it's just, it's absolutely delightful. Uh, kind of a, kind of a, in the same vein as The Sting in many respects. They, yeah. they wanted to sort of uh, do something a little bit similar, but a little bit more slapsticky, and uh, it's just, it's absolutely wonderful. I, I find this film so charming. Uh, you know, small time crooks. Uh, it, it's just really great. I like Mark Riddell, he's a halfway decent actor too. Mark, absolutely true. Mark, Mark Riddell's done a lot of great stuff. And then the last two from Twilight Time uh, is the effect of gamma rays on men in the moon, marigolds, which is the longest title that somehow everybody manages to remember. Uh, this was produced and directed by Paul Newman, and starred his wife Joanne Woodward, and uh, really. Uh, very, very touching uh, adaptation by Alvin Sargent of the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning play, which, uh, you know, still kind of packs a wallop. It feels very 1970s, but it's still really, really very, very sharp. And then the other one is The Incident, which is still also packs a wallop from 1967, uh, directed by Larry Pierce. Really, uh, uh, really tough performances in here. Yeah. Uh, Bo Bridges, in particular, yeah. is just so, so, so good. As is Martin Sheen, as one of these uh, two punks who uh, terrorize people on a, on a New York subway. Really gritty, uh, kind of cinema verite look to this oh, thing. Ruby D, Brock Peters, Tony Mustante. That, that, you know, yeah. A real John Cassavetes sort of feel to it. Not and John Cassavetes, but that mood. And Pierce does a commentary here with, uh, with uh, uh, Nick Redman from, uh, from Twilight Time. So it's just absolutely terrific film. And I think that's it then. All so right. we are we are done this week. We will be back next week to talk about the Oscars. <laughs> <laughs>